and the face of the world. We hereby proclaim the Irish Republic as a sovereign independent state and we pledge our lives and the lives of our comrades in arms to the cause of its freedom, of its welfare and of its exaltation among the nations. Hear ye, hear ye. This morning the pacifist and advocate of women's rights, Mr. Francis Sheehy Skeffington, was summarily executed by firing squad at Portobello Barracks by order of Captain Bowen Coulters. Two journalists, Mr. Thomas Dickinson and Mr. Patrick McIntyre, were also executed in the same atrocity. Mr. Sheehy Skeffington, a native of Babyburg and the Cabin, was returning to Manor Rat Mines previous evening when he was apprehended at Portobello Bridge. Earlier in the day he had been attempting to prevent the looting of shops and stores in the city centre area and as a doctor had attended to some wounded British soldiers. It is reported that Captain Bowen Goldhurst has been confined to barracks and may face a possible court-martial as a result of his actions. Report from the GPO. By Holiday Monday 1916, most senior British police and army officers are on leave or at the races in Ferry House. All the talk is of the war in Europe. How are the over 100,000 Irish soldiers doing out there? In the city, 1,250 Irish volunteers, citizens, army and common demand meet up, divide into different battalions and Pierce, Connolly and Plunkett lead one contingent to take over the GPO beside Nelson's Pillar in Sackford Street, now O'Connell Street. At 12 noon the GPO is captured. Staff and customers are cleared out. At 12.20 the Irish Republic flag is raised on the roof and at 12.45 Pierce, accompanied by Connolly, comes out the main door to read the proclamation of the Irish Republic to passers-by. And for the next six days, the GPO is the headquarters to the Irish Provisional Government, with five of the seven proclamation signatories there. Day two is quiet. The volunteers erect barricades out on Connell Street. They take the Metropo Hotel. There's some gunfire in Sackville Street, with more heard from down the quays and across the river. Day three is the big day. General Maxwell arrives from England to take charge. And the Helga gunboat sails up the Liffey and shells and levels Liberty Hall and other buildings, including the Metropole Hotel in Sackville Street. Day four is GPO day. Heavily shelled now by the Helga from the Liffey. Also fired on from Trinity College, the Gresham Hotel, Henry Street and Moore Street. Conley out of the street gets a fatal wound, on the, a serious wound on the ankle and is confined to a stretcher. He never walks again. Day five, the GPO is collapsing around them under shell fire. Volunteers are forced to quit. Pierce calls the volunteers together, thanks them all for their effort, and he himself is the last to leave. Out into Moore Street, where the new headquarters is established at 16 Moore Street, because there's a British contingent at the top of the street that can't get away. Day 6, Saturday the 29th of April, 12 noon, Pierce orders the surrender. He sends Nurse Elizabeth O'Farrell up Moore Street under a white flag to convey surrender to Brigadier General Lowe. Then he goes himself with the nurse to meet Lowe, and he agrees unconditional surrender. McDonough at Jacob's factory and De Valera at Boland's Mill at first don't accept the surrender because Pierce is a prisoner. But when Lowe meets with McDonough on the Sunday, an unconditional surrender is again agreed and it's all over. A report from Mount Street Bridge, Friday, 28th of April, 1916. On Monday last, Lieutenant Michael Malone of 16 volunteers took up positions around Mount Street Bridge with orders to prevent British reinforcements from entering the city. Their first encounter was with a unit of the British Home Guard. Firing from well fortified positions, the volunteers inflicted a high rate of casualties among the soldiers. 
The survivors, with the assistance of local residents, eventually reached, reached the safety of Beggar's Bush Barracks. Two battalions of Sherwood Foresters, making their way from Kingstown into the city, were ambushed at the junction of Northumberland Road and Paddington Street. At least 10 soldiers were killed by the first volley. Further British casualties were suffered as they attempted to charge the volunteer positions. Attempts to outflank the occupied buildings resulted in yet more casualties. Four volunteers occupying the local parochial hall, having expended all their ammunition, attempted to retreat from the rear of the building, but were arrested by the military. The foresters have tried time and again to cross the bridge, but have been repulsed. In an attempt to gain entry to Tom William House, the British threw a large number of grenades into the building, which is now engulfed in flames. The area is filled with bodies. It is estimated that there have been over 200 British casualties, with three volunteers confirmed dead. <coughs> News from the Royal College of Surgeons. The college was occupied by Conway's Irish Citizen Army. Under the command of Commandant Michael Mullen, Captain Christopher Poole and Countess Markovich. This was one of the principal sites occupied by the volunteers, though it was one mile from the GPO, and its surgeons played a vital role in treating the injured. Day two, British troops at, at the Shelburne and nearby machine gun rebels at Stephen's Green who fall back to the Royal College of Surgeons. This was seen as one of the first acts of the Irish Citizen Army. Day five, rebels continue to hold out at Rollins Mill, the College of Surgeons, Jacobs, the South Dublin Union and the Four Courts. Day 6. De Valera receives Pierce's surrender order at Boland's Mill and eventually surrenders, as do rebels on Stephen's Green and Jacobs. The college had held out for six days, though it had seen little action until the surrender order, when Captain Henry de Corsi Wheeler, an Irish man from County Kildare, took surrender of the rebels in the Royal College of Surgeons, where Countess Markovitch was stationed. <coughs> Reports from the Four Courts. Monday 24th April, 11.49am. A group of approximately 120 rebels had stormed the Four Courts of Keys a short distance from Sackville Street. 4.31pm. Commandant Edward Daly is leading the rebels in the four courts. At 25 years of age, Daly is the youngest commandant in the rising. Wednesday, April 26th, 3.20 p.m. Rebels in the four courts have set nearby buildings alight in order to smoke out British riflemen who are holed up in there. Thursday, April 27th, a machine gun on top of Jervis Street Hospital is now firing on the four posts. Friday, April 28th, 10.13 a.m. Maxwell has ordered some troops to close in on the four posts. Saturday, April 29th, 11 a.m. There are bloody scenes near the back of the four posts. It appears British soldiers have been at it or shot 15 innocent men who have mistook for rebels their searching houses on North King Street. 5.03 p.m. <coughs> rebels at the four courts have surrendered. The men there were reported to be stunned when they received the order to surrender. Some argued that they should continue to hold the four courts, but in the end they have complied with the order. Statistics, 485 dead, half of them civilians, including 38 children, 1,350 wounded, 3,430 men, and 47 men have been arrested. 
The writing is over. Apparently, it has failed utterly. But then, between the 3rd and the 12th of May, 15 rebels are executed, including the seven signatories. There were voices for and against the writing. As we hear in Sean O'Casey's play written ten years later about the rising, the plow in the stars. First, the voice of the Irish volunteers. Comrade soldiers of the Irish volunteers and of the citizens' army, we rejoice in this terrible war in Europe. The old heart of the earth needed to be warmed with the red wine of the battlefields. Such august homage was never offered to God as this. The homage of millions of lives given gladly for love of country. And we must be ready to pour out the same red wine in the same glorious sacrifice. For without the shedding of blood there is no redemption. And then the voice of a Protestant, Bessie Burgess. When the rebels are running back through the streets pursued by the British soldiers, she shouts out the window, He has a rightly shine boy now! <laughs> Sorry men, the lasses, that have been kissing and cuddling their boys into the shedding of blood. <laughs> Filling their minds with fairy tales that had no beginning, but please God will have a bloody quick ending. Turning bitter into sweet and sweet into bitter. Stabbing in the back the men that's dying in the trenches for them. It's a bad thing for anyone that tries to jit the Ten Commandments. For judgments are prepared for scorners and stripes for the backs of fools. Rule Britannia, Britannia rules the waves. Britons never, never, never shall be slaves. And you ain't turned out Trump yet. The further exception of the Dallas Stars. The British soldiers' perspective. Four men, residents in a tenement, are playing cards in a room, and a British soldier bursts in. Roy, are you all men in this here house? Because all the men in the district has to be rounded up. There's snipers about you somewhere, and someone is giving them help, and we have to take precautions. If I had my way, I'd make more join up, but do that bit. <clears throat> anyway, I think it's nearly over. We got them surrounded and we're closing in on the blighters. Anyway, it was only a little bit of a dog fight. Right. That, that, that's one, another one of our men in by that lost sniper. He's definitely coming about here somewhere. God, when we get the blighter, we'll give him the cold steel, we will. We'll jack the belly out of him, we'll. But it'll still be over. We're pumping lead in on from every side now. They should soon be showing up the white flag, they will. The surrender and account of North Dismal Fire. I received orders from General Lowe to provide a white flag, which was hung out of a house, safe from being fired upon. I then left the house on Saturday the 29th of April with a message from Commandant Pierce to the Commandant of the British Forces that our Commandant wished to meet with them. When I arrived at the barrier waving my little white flag, I was told to wait for someone in command to see me. When he appeared, I said, The Commandant of the Irish Republican Army wishes to meet with the Commandant of the British Forces in Ireland. The officer replied, The Shelbert should be I replied, The Irish Republican Army, they call themselves. And I think it's a really good name, too. Search the woman, she's a spy. He took me to the now Bank of Ireland, where he searched me. Eventually, General Lowe came after about an hour, and he was a gentleman. He said that he would bring me in his motor car back to Commandant Pierce and to tell Pierce that he would only meet him if he surrendered unconditionally. Proclamation Part 2 